Today's episode is brought to you by our amazing friends at Pygmonic. On their behalf, I hope you enjoy. Welcome everyone to the Medspiration Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nav, and this is episode number 24 with Dr. Uma Naidu. Anxiety. So much of us have anxiety, especially over this last 12 yeah, months. Absolutely. What can we eat to help with that? Many studies have actually shown that there's several things like flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, salmon, walnuts, all are rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Fiber in terms of anxiety can be your friend mm -hmm. because not only does fiber break down in your body more slowly, it actually helps your gut bacteria, it helps good bacteria develop in your gut microbiome, which we're all talking about these days. So fiber-rich foods are nuts, seeds, again, that you can add in, lentils are all really wonderful to not only help you keep on a more even kill during the day, but actually help you lower your anxiety. And it turns out that so many things can worsen anxiety that we have to be careful about caffeine because caffeine can actually make people more anxious. So if they notice that, again, paying attention to body intelligence, they want to stay either, they want to switch to decaf or half-caf or stay under 400 milligrams of caffeine a day and have it early in the day so that it doesn't disrupt their sleep and, and drive the anxiety. Other things to worry about is gluten was found to be associated with worsening symptoms of anxiety. Sometimes people have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Mm -hmm. I actually had someone recently who said they'd struggled with depression for a long time until they got tested and realized that they had not celiac disease, but sort of this non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And by cutting out gluten, their symptoms improved. So gluten was associated with as well as artificial sweeteners like aspartame, saccharin, sucralose. And like I mentioned, unfortunately, stevia did worsen symptoms of anxiety then being cautious with alcohol, how you consume alcohol, when you consume it, and the fact that we all have to be a little bit careful because during the pandemic, we know from, from studies and from some CDC data that use of alcohol and drugs has increased. So we've got to be careful mm -hmm. about that. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're having a blessed day. Thank you so much for pressing play and tuning into the Medspiration podcast, where our goal is to help you bridge the gap between medical science and your mind, body, and spirit. In today's episode, we're bringing you Dr. Uma Naidu. She's a Harvard-trained psychiatrist who's also a professional chef and a nutrition specialist. Dr. Naidu is responsible for creating the first ever clinical service in nutritional psychiatry. And if that's not cool enough, she's been asked by the APA, or the American Psychiatric Association, to offer the first academic text in nutritional psychiatry. I read her best-selling book, This Is Your Brain on Food, and we go in depth about the foods she uses to help her patients fight depression, anxiety, PTSD, ADHD, and more. I'm so excited to get your feedback on this one, fam. Please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. Make sure you tell every single person that you know and love about this show because it would mean the world to our team and it would help us medspire more individuals like yourself. And no matter where you are in the world, you can tag us on Instagram and we'll start a conversation with you. Tag us in your stories, share us in your posts, and we'll make sure we reach out. And a special thank you to our sponsor today, Pigmonic. I personally use Pygmonic in my studies for step one directly off of my iPhone. Their learning system powers thousands of mnemonic videos and quizzes that have been scientifically proven to increase long-term memory retention by up to 331%. And trust me, they're not lying. There was things on the USMLEs that I would have never remembered if I didn't remember the Pygmonic. It sounds crazy, but it's kind of like cliff notes meet saturday morning cartoons for higher education they help med students nps pas farm d's rns lpns paramedics and pre-med students rock their course exams boards and become more competent healthcare providers pigmonic has partnered with medspiration to help make learning and memorizing easier than ever so I know the CEO personally, and we got you a pretty sweet deal here. You could check them out for free. If you sign up, you'll get instant access to a free video and quiz every day, no credit card required. You can use the promo code MEDSPIRATION for 20% off any premium subscription. Again, guys, I would really recommend checking them out and trying out their resources. I promise you won't be disappointed. We'll have a link provided to you in the description below. And now, without further ado, let the medspiration begin. 
<laughs> Dr. Uma Naido, welcome to the Medspiration podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you one of my greatest Medspirations when it comes to nutritional psychiatry. Dr. Naidu, I read your book. This is Your Brain on Food in its entirety. I want to acknowledge you for the impact that you're making on our culture of medicine and in general. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, your book was extremely enlightening, and I will continue to recommend it to my patients and my colleagues. So without further ado, can you please introduce yourself? Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that warm welcome and congratulations on the great podcast that you've uh, set up with your colleagues. So I'm Dr. Uma Naidu. I do a few things and those uh, different aspects of my life really came together in my niche work in nutritional psychiatry. I, I wish I could say that I had some grand plan or um, that I had plotted it out a certain way, but I really didn't. I followed things that I loved to do. I followed a sense of inspiration and what brought me joy and, you know, practicing medicine and being a psychiatrist brought me joy. But I also felt that from my Hindu background, that, you know, we've always talked about the mind-body connection, meditation, mindfulness, a holistic approach, Ayurvedic medicine. And I feel like I had to bring that in the room when I started my work. And that really was one of the ways that all of this got started. That's amazing. You know, similar intention uh, with Medspiration. We have a mind, body, spirit philosophy. I'm also from India. And, you know, um, I, I think it's, it's kind of in our genetics to be bridging East and West. Some of it might come from the fact that we grow up around yoga, meditation, mindfulness, and that that speak, so, mm -hmm. to, so, so to say, and that, that connection just comes, uh, it, it's something we come to the world with. So I feel like when some of us just enter the allopathic medical field, we bring that with us. And, and I think it's so needed in this day and age around how we know, you know, how lifestyle now impacts different diseases, including mental health. Amen. Uh, I couldn't agree more. So my intention today is to be able to dissect your book and to share digestible practical tips with our audience. So are you ready to rock and roll? I am. All right. Well, first, I want to start with your training and your personal path to better health. Uh, can you take our audience through your journey and how you eventually became a, a triple threat in the food space as a Harvard trained, board certified psychiatrist, nutritional specialist, and a professionally trained chef? It goes back to the young days when I was a child and I grew up around food, a lot of joy, nurturance, love, family. Uh, but allopathic doctors, as well as a few Ayurvedic practitioners in the family. And I didn't need to cook because there were always grandmothers, aunts, older cousins in the kitchen. So I always sort of hung around. So it's always around food and that sort of inspiration. So for that reason, actually, you'll, you'll appreciate this now. I learned to cook later in life. And the joke in my family when I was getting married was, you know, I knew how to bake. So it was, you know, <laughs> husband is going to live on cake. And uh, <laughs> as, as people in Indian culture know, moms and mother-in-laws will say. So uh, I, it, was a, it was quite a big joke. And fortunately, you know, my husband is a little bit more advanced than others. He knew how to cook. So I thought, I think we were okay. But all, all to say that uh, because I came to it slightly later in life and I knew how to bake and I loved the science around baking, when I did start to cook and I wanted to practice my mom's recipes and, you know, bring my spices forward and things like that, I found that it was a very mindful space for me. It was really a creative space when I was studying for boards or studying for exams, whichever stage of life it was. And I paid attention to that. So I loved that to grow as more than just a pastime or something that I had to do. And when I started seeing psychiatric patients, I realized, you know, psychopharmacology, as much as the medications I have prescribed and continue to prescribe have saved the lives of many of my patients, I also knew there were terrible side effects. And I could read that, I could see that, I was studying it. And I felt a sense of, not just compassion, but I felt a sense of urgency around starting to talk about that with patients. So mm -hmm. I would just ask them simple things. You know, we don't have much time in the room with patients. So I would ask them, what are you doing for exercise? What are you eating? You know, if they brought in a certain type of food or snack or breakfast, I'd ask them about it, not in a judgmental way, but just also, what are you eating there? You know, could some yogurt with berries be maybe a better choice? So let's look at the, you know, and because sometimes people, and I don't believe in Italian calories, but sometimes that's how people understand or relate to it. But that grew my love and interest in, in really 
taking nutrition to different level and studying more. But really the inspiration around culinary school, this is kind of a funny story. So, so as I was working in my early times in Boston and learning that, you know, that cooking journey, we couldn't afford, you know, cable television. On PBS, there was this show with Julia Child, the, the French chef, mm-hmm. and I'd have it on all the time. And she was very entertaining. And I thought, well, if she could flip an omelet and drop things and you know, she was entertaining and she was fun. I thought, okay, I can do it. So it gave me confidence. So that was actually part of my journey, very, very really part of my journey. Although I would say that I probably am most comfortable or know most about Indian cuisine. You know, in culinary school, you learn everything and then I would watch her. So when I learned and understood and read about her life and followed her recipes, that she actually went to culinary school later on in her life as a second career. I thought, well, if she could do it, why not me? Is there a way I can do this? And that was really an example of following my joy and, and where my passion lay and not knowing that actually I would be able to put it together. So that's how that happened. And when I think back, I'm not quite sure how I survived those years, but apparently I was inspired because I went through it okay. I came out the other wow. end. And so it was as these conversations continue to happen that I realized there was some value in not only talking to a patient, a client about what they were eating, especially if I was prescribing a medication for mental health or they were considering it, but it became an important part of that. Now the words and term nutritional psychiatry are quite nascent. But you know, mentors of mine at Mass Journal were studying methylfolate and magnesium and vitamin D and omega-3s for decades. So mm-hmm. we've known about these independent nutrients and vitamins and minerals, but really putting it, it's like putting it together on a plate. You know, we don't need one one food or one nutrient. We tend to eat a composed plate of food. And that's how I think about nutritional psychiatry. It's also really not about saying to someone, you have to have 10 milligrams of Prozac or 10 10 blueberries. It's how do we put it together? Some people don't need medications, but that's a careful assessment too. That's interesting. So out of curiosity, did you do culinary school during residency, after residency? residency how after, did you do it af- after, after. Okay. After. Okay, that's, and it, that's incredible. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. You've been asked by the American Psychiatric Association to offer the first academic text in nutritional psychiatry, I believe. And you also founded the first hospital-based clinical service in nutritional psychiatry in the United States. That is one of the coolest things I've ever heard in my life. I just want you to know that. So how did you set that up and what function does it provide? Again, it was born out of these interests and having really great mentors. I have to say, who listened to what I was asking in supervision or discussions or meetings that I was having with them, told them about what I was up to. And an opportunity, you know, one mentor connected me to someone else in my department that really cared about this topic and who helped me, basically supported me founding this clinic. And, and the clinical service now has really become, it's it's pretty small, but it's small because it's really focused on individuals that I can see because I'm licensed there. Unfortunately, people reaching out to me from other parts of the country, it's not as it's yeah. not right now possible, right? Through the hospital. Really around nutritional and mental health. So as people have seen or heard my book or have heard about my work or read blogs or newspaper articles, things, people really want to know how they can feel better emotionally. And I feel as I say that now, there's, you know, there's also a greater need for forming more structure around this, training oh, yeah. more people. And when I say structure, you know, trainings for individuals who can carry this forward, creating more curriculum. And I'm, I'm in the process of doing some of that. So that's, you know, I think I think hopefully we'll bring this forward in uh, with the academic heft, but also be able to to help other people learn how to do nutritional assessments in terms of nutrition and mental health. Because the gut brain connection, you know, the two decades now of budgeting research is really showing us more. So I feel like we need to have that conversation with patients about how they're eating and, and, and their mental health. Absolutely. I mean, uh, me personally, I think that, you know, hopefully one day uh, every hospital in the country can have like something related to nutritional psychiatry. And, you know, out of interest, Chris, can you walk me through like a hospital admission on your service? How have you made nutrition the central tenant? I heard you say that you do a nutritional intake. Does this okay. require uh, more nutritionists? Do you have chefs? Like, how does it work? Right. So the way that I've adapted this, it's all outpatient. Um, it's oh, all outpatient. Gotcha. Okay. So it's an outpatient service. And it really is about working with someone around their mental well-being who wants to use food as one of the pillars of how they will feel better. So it involves a full medical history. It may involve collaborating with 
whoever referred the patient. So it could be a gastroenterologist, it could be a primary care, it could be an orthopedic surgeon, and making sure that the person has a set of labs that I can review. We might add more testing to that. Again, that's a collaboration with the other physician. Sometimes I get referrals from psychiatrists who are prescribing the medications, mm-hmm. but wanting, or their patients may say, look, I have symptoms of OCD. I'd like to see if I could not go up in the medications. Can I work also with Dr. Naidu to see if we can nutritionally work on this from a different angle. So the model of care that I provide at my clinic is holistic, integrated, and functional. I'm always looking for a root cause, always looking at, you know, sleep, exercise, um, activities, hydration, mindfulness, yoga, all of those components, not just not just nutrition, but in the book, we felt, and I felt strongly that that was the big piece that was missing in our conversation because doctors are not taught nutrition. Yeah. So, and that's where the educational gap comes in. I mean, I'm speaking about sort of setting up training and more educational opportunities that I'm working on because I feel like we need the help that we, we're expected to talk to patients about hypertension and family history of diabetes and this and that, but we're not really taught enough in medical school. I don't know what, what your medical school background in nutrition was, but it certainly wasn't, isn't much for most of us. In the assessment, I walk them through, they might have several blood tests or lab tests we might need to get. We do a full history. I walk them through, you know, what they're actually eating. What are they actually doing? I enjoy speaking to people. So I obtain as much information from them, you know, and try to get to know them and try to find the ways that we can take someone who may think they're eating healthy and, you know, any one of us can up our game and then adapt what they're doing and use the principles that I outline in my book. Oh man, Understanding, you know, that things change all the time, of course. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, that that's so cool. I wish you were everywhere so I could refer my patients to you. And you. Um, like you mentioned, at least in terms of formal education in nutrition, you know, in my undergrad, I did nutrition. Med school, beyond like biochemistry, like you don't really get into nutrition. Now, luckily, I I grew up as an athlete and, Mm -hmm. you know, eating food was always something that was a part of my culture as well. So, you know, that's something that uh, I'm really big on, but you know, I don't, I'm not like a nutritionist by any means, but I always tell my patients, 80% of the disease in the United States can be prevented if you just eat right, if you exercise and you don't smoke. It's actually a Harvard Medical School that did that study, a large, large study. So that's, that's beautiful. I'm, I'm just so grateful that you're doing that. Wow. Well, thank you. You know, now we say this to two patients all the time, but I feel like there isn't an, there's an absorption factor because, yeah. you know, there's such a problem with metabolic health at the moment oh, and totally. we're all part of it, you know, and, and I feel like people don't, we, we don't know enough about food labels. We don't know enough about the food system. You know, we know things like organic or not organic or yeah. you know, how, to, how to try to obtain better, better groceries or, or fresh produce. But I feel like the details are missing in the conversation. So a lot of people, you know, take an example of the patient who very proudly I took a photograph of the breakfast cereal she brought for her child. So she was my patient and she was saying, you know, you're teaching me about fiber and whole grain. Like this is the cereal. Look, you know, at the cereal I got for my child. So I looked at it and then we looked at it together online and I knew it was not what I was referring to. And that's when you have to be super specific with recommendations and helping people understand. The food labeling is so tricky. They can label a food that it has whole grain, but the percentage of whole grain may not be large. You know, there's a a whole thing around food labeling laws. They're not breaking the law, but it's misleading to the customer. So she thinks, and yet it had tons of sugar in it and it was, didn't have much fiber and it had a tiny, it did have whole grain. It wasn't that it didn't have whole grain, but unfortunately there were ingredients in that that did not make it healthy. So that's a great example of, you know, you speak to people about whole grains or if they consume whole grain or different ways to add fiber to their diet and they they try to act on it. But, you know, as consumers as well, we have to be informed. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they always remember that moment because it's it's oh, important yeah. to 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 know. Or, or, the, or the patient who told me that, you know, doctor, technically pizza and Coke is a vegetarian meal. That's um, true. That's so <laughs> yeah. true. And that's very scary when you think about it. So sometimes I get the best quotes from my, my patients, I'll tell you that. And this is kind of where we get into the the connection between gut health and uh, mental and emotional well-being. So h- how does that connection work? The best way to explain it, as I do to clients, I know that many, many of your audience members are, are physicians or in the medical field, but you know the way that I speak to patients about it is they don't realize the gut and brain are connected because they're not close by in the body. But when you explain that they actually, in the embryo, 
arise from the same cells and then move apart by development in the body. Mm -hmm. That helps them understand. Then we talk about the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve. The way I break it down for them is it's, a, it's like a superhighway. It's like a bidirectional superhighway that allows for 24-7 chemical messaging between the brain and gut and the gut and the brain. Why does this become important? Because another factor is that most people, I think, in the country know what an SSRI is or Prozac, the mitocondrial Zoloft. That's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, but more than 90% of serotonin receptors are in the gut. So that helps them understand it too. During pandemic times, it really started to emphasize the fact that the a very large component of the immune system is in the gut. So how you eat really does impact that. And so, you know, beyond citrus fruit, people need to understand things like red bell pepper has one of the highest levels of vitamin C. So adding that to a salad or whatever it is, a stir fry becomes important. So, you know, just sharing that as an outline helps them understand that there's this this connection. And, you know, it's anatomical, it's it's biochemical, it's physiological. There's a way to, to unpack it for people that they realize, wow, if what I'm eating gets digested and, and then it has an impact, it never occurred to me that when I feel a certain way, I feel fatigued or I need to lay down after a certain meal or a certain meal makes me energized or, or I feel lighter on days when, wow, when I think back, I eat healthy on those days. You know, growing those those factors to people's attention becomes very powerful because they start to connect the the sort of cliche that we are what we eat. Understanding follows that. And then what I find now is that when people start to understand something, they want to act yeah. and, and, and have an action step on that because there's understanding which kind of sinks in. And that's when habit changes start to form. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And one of the things that I, I loved about your book so much is how many studies you mentioned. So the, the book's really objective as well. And uh, one of the cool things you mentioned, I, I learned this from your book, 30 years ago, hepatic encephalopathy was one of the, the first delirium-like states that showed the connection between the gut and brain. And you, you mentioned if, if normal gut bacteria are not present, a production of neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, glutamate, GABA, they're all critically important for the regulation of mood, memory, and attention. Those can be impacted when, when that mm -hmm. happens. So beautiful. I love how eloquently um, you explain that. Um, one theme that I did notice in your book was when you discuss everything from depression depression, anxiety, PTSD, ADHD, uh, brain fog, OCD, insomnia, I think uh, is near the uh, end of the book, was that many of the same foods can make these conditions worse, right? So what foods are those and why do they do this? Absolutely. So there are some some specifics in certain chapters like glutamates with OCD and monosodium glutamate. But in general, what I felt was important as I did, you know, sort of outline and read, kind of do the research for the book was that people know if you say trans fats or if you use a word like process, they, they, they understand it almost as a buzzword. They've either heard it on television or they've heard a nutritionist speak about it or a doctor mention it. But what I feel was important for people to know is there's a real association with mental health. Mm -hmm. So added and refined sugars drive depression and worsen anxiety. If people are trying to get off sugar, artificial sweeteners also worsen anxiety and our gut disruptors for the most part. When you know you come to processed and ultra processed foods because they actually contain and, and I say this understanding it's very hard for us not to eat some form of packaged something in the U US. Mm -hmm. But again awareness means that you think twice when you're buying that packaged or processed food. But you know the, the ultra processed foods have colorants, dyes, stabilizers, fillers, preservatives that are not good for us, often a lot of sodium. So just, you know, unfortunately have a poor association. And then there were studies that associated trans fats with worsening behavioral aggression. So something else to under, you know, just to underscore and to understand, you know, process, things like processed vegetable oils um, that are often used. And by the way, avocado and olive and coconut are not their fruit, their, their fruit oils. So, you know, we're talking about the less expensive oils that often are used in, say, fast food restaurants because of the cost. They just unfortunately worsen a condition such as anxiety and things like that. Okay. So you did mention uh, mono sodium glutamate and uh mm -hmm. and ocd just to piggyback on that so what foods have msg in them right so you know monosodium glutamate you'll see them in certain types of ethnic foods but they're also in some natural foods so it's important 
for someone with OCD to realize that glutamates and glutamic acid can be found in things like fish sauce, oyster sauce, miso, Parmesan cheese, certain ready-to-eat meals and mushrooms as well. So some actually you know, regular foods that we might be eating, but someone with OCD has to look at the list of foods to avoid. And I don't exclude those foods from recipes if they're healthy whole foods. But I do say to someone, if they have OCD, just be a little bit careful, maybe omit the mushrooms from that recipe, because you don't realize that those are natural sources that could be driving your symptoms. And we've had experiences where individuals who have been on medications for OCD, but who start to cut back on those foods, especially that food group, have had not only an improvement in symptoms over time, nothing happens overnight, and even have worked with their prescribing psychiatrists to slightly lower their medications. So, you know, I think that that, that's a win for someone who has a condition like that. They take less medication to control symptoms, but they really are cautious about what they eat. Beautiful. Now, is that found on ingredients labels? Can people just look at what they're buying and see it? So here's the thing with with glutamate, monosodium glutamate, and with sugar. Sugar has upwards of close to, I'm told, 250 other names on food labels. Right, yeah. And not as many with glutamates and MSG, but definitely if you're not sure of an ingredient, I would look at the label, I would Google it while you're there or if you're right. buying it online and check. Because like I said, with food labeling laws, they're within the law, but it's often misleading to the consumer. So people don't realize brown rice syrup is actually a form of sugar. And ultimately those different forms of sugar wow. do break down to sugar. So so it's just little things like that that people learn or that four grams of sugar is one teaspoon. So the other thing about helping people understand about sugar is that our food, we cook in ounces and pounds. Mm-hmm. All our recipes in the US are standardized to pounds. And any recipe you buy in this country, any recipe book or cookbook will have every single recipe with pounds and ounces. Mm-hmm. But our food labels are grams. So yeah. how does someone actually, you know, how do we put that together? So I always say to people for, for, for sugar, especially, and then, you know, give them guidelines around other things. But for sugar, I think it's just something that's, it's, that, that stands out. So. Oh, and sugar's big. I mean, we're all using uh, sugar. So are there any healthy artificial sweeteners? Are they all kind of something you shouldn't have? Like, I know when I have coffee, I use organic honey. It tastes mm-hmm. fine. Uh, I found it a little bit better than sugar. So what what, what do you yeah. recommend there? So the of all the, sh- all the sugars, honey, I actually think has a lot of health benefits. The immune system, I like manuka honey when I can get it. Me too. And a little bit or drizzle is okay. Always in moderation, right? Because with any one of us, we don't need a ton of it. So I very specifically say in moderation. But with artificial sweeteners, two of them, stevia, although although stevia does drive anxiety, so be a little bit careful if you have symptoms of anxiety. Stevia and erythritol, right now, from what I've reviewed, are slightly better than some of the others. Erythritol gotcha. is sold as swerve. And I found with, with clients when they introduce them to super dark, raw, and natural chocolate, like more than 80%, unsweetened, so beyond the natural sugars, with the word cacao in the label, which is great cacao flavonols for your brain health, which are rich antioxidants. They find that if they start to eat a square of that chocolate and get their palate used to that, oh. that they, they sort of no longer want a candy bar. They don't need to go through two candy bars. So when I've worked with people around just slowly getting off sugar, just introducing other foods, getting their palate used to it, appreciating that flavor, they need much less of it and it actually helps with cravings. Gotcha. And you know, you mentioned in the book in 2002, Arthur Westover and Lauren Marengel, uh, they found a profound correlation between people who ate sugar and those with depression. So mm-hmm. wh- why might sugar cause depression? One of the ways is they disrupt the gut. So many of these mechanisms, so the first chapter in my book is called the gut brain romance for a reason. Now there are several mechanisms, but the one that I think is most, forgive the pun, but most digestible for people is that many of these substances either create inflammation or they disrupt the gut. So our um, gut microbiome is made up of like 100 trillion microbes. And, you know, they're probably only the size, if you put them all together, they're probably the size of a little avocado, but they, they live down there. Wow. 
and they need to be nurtured. They need to be fed. And, you know, some articles will argue that we have more mi microbes than human cells. So there's that whole discussion as well, which, which is quite true. But like with all living things, they need to be fed and they need to be fed well. When you feed them vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, healthy whole grains, lentils, legumes, that's fiber. And fiber mm -hmm. feeds them. Fiber nurtures them. You can't get fiber, unfortunately, from animal and seafood protein. So then the gut microbes do well. They do their function and they're fending off forms of inflammation. If you feed them sugar, the bad microbes there thrive and they overcome the good microbes. And that's the setting for starting off inflammation, eventually leading to dysbiosis, eventually leading to a condition that people call leaky gut, which is mm -hmm. intestinal permeability. There's only one single cell layer, right, of the gut lining. Yep. So it's pretty delicate. Now, one of the things that, for example, Rudy Tanzi at MGH talks about is that neuroinflammation is now really being seen as one of the drivers of things like cognitive health and Alzheimer's disease. So when we set up imbalance and dysbiosis and inflammation in our gut, the loop is that we set up neuroinflammation. One way to think about this is when you're eating sugar in that way, it's feeding those bad microbes and sort of disrupting that balance that you need to have in your gut. And it's a case of really eating as best we can in any given day to feed more of the healthy microbes in the gut that will, will really fend off disease, help us with digestion. They do so many things. So uh, I love the way you explained that step by step. You did mention in the book, Look, there was a study in 2019 done. It was a meta-analysis on like 37,000 people. It showed if people drank just over like a 12 ounce can of soda, which is about 45 grams of sugar, mm -hmm. uh, they increased their risk of depression by 5%. And where it gets kind of pretty crazy is like if they drank two and a half cans of soda a day, which is about 98 grams of sugar, the risk jumped to 25%. And, you know, I, I work at a federally qualified health program. And I mean, I have patients who are drinking like two, two liters a day, you know, and like, um, the it's thing also that, inexpensive, it's also cheap. It's, exactly. It's an, it's, exactly. You know, yeah. And that's, that's and it's, yeah. probably the most frustrating thing I'd say is like, if yeah. it's cheaper than water and you notice like, uh, my patients, it seems like their, their gut microbiome gets really, really used to being fed that stuff. Like they prefer yes. soda over water and yes. it becomes just like an addiction. Almost. You can't just cut it out cold turkey. It's really no. rare. I actually see it cut out cold turkey, but it's like no. incrementally every time they come in, we're like trying to adjust and add more water, mm -hmm. you know? So any other uh, recommendations that I could tell my patients? Absolutely. So, you know, I think you make an excellent point. The fact, the, the fact that they're sort of used to it. Two things about it. Maybe explaining to them that sugar works with the dopamine receptors and dopamine reward system in the brain the same way that cocaine does. And that has been shown uh, in research. Yeah. Helping them understand that, that just that little sort of educational nugget around, well, it's kind of acting like a drug in your body and you're getting so used to it. And having two liters of soda is not doing your body good. You know, how can we cut back on that and switch to more water, just plain water, which technically, you know, you don't have to pay for. Maybe True. you need to get a water filter depending on where you live. But, you know, it's just uh, how can they buy into that? And this may be a stretch for someone who's used to soda, but, you know, can they start thinking about adding fresh fruit or citrus to their water? Mm. Can they at least move to maybe, it's not my favorite, but, you know, just a, a type of flavored water that has no sugar in it. And there are okay. many on the market, but they're not that, they, they're sometimes expensive but at least there's no added sugar in that and then work their way down that chain. But I think explaining to them how that addiction cycle works becomes super important. And even showing them like in a 20 ounce Coke, even visually, the type of bottle of Coke that's say in a vending machine, right? Which I know certainly is in a lot of hospitals right? Or, or clinics, right? And then showing them what 10 or 12 teaspoons of sugar looks like, because that's the amount, but you know, like 10 teaspoons of sugar show that what that is in a bowl. And, you know, if you were having a glass of water, if you were having, you know, say a nut milk, if you were having say a cup of tea, would you be adding 10 teaspoons or X number? Wow. And I would break it down that way, because I think that that, the visual sometimes powerful. really helps people. It's powerful. Yeah. Um, same thing with yogurt, right? So yogurt, great source of plain yogurt, great source of probiotics. So actually, you know, it's it's, it's sort of you do fermented foods, you can take a probiotic supplement, but yogurts have live active cultures. So I've had people come in and say, well, I've started eating blueberry yogurt. You told me blueberries were good for my bread. And it's true, I did. But here's the thing, you know, four ounces, which is a half a cup, yeah. can have 
eight teaspoons of sugar because of being fruited. Wow. Whereas if you just took your own half a cup of plain Greek yogurt with the protein, the great source of live active cultures in them, it added some blueberries, even frozen. Frozen is, is fine. Tangent for a second is fresh and frozen fruit for your patients to know are actually quite healthy in this country. So if they can save money on frozen veggies and frozen fruit as long as there's no added sugar or syrup or sauce because they're flash frozen. So that's another cost saving measure. But you know, piece a little bit of yogurt with some fr fresh or frozen berries and cinnamon or drop of honey for sweetening. And you kind of have to guide people around honey as mm -hmm. well, because yeah. you just say a little yeah. bit of honey, a little bit of honey to you and me could be a drop or drizzle to someone else could be a quarter cup. So very true. Uh, very true. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful. OK, so I took some notes there. Just the, the cocaine dop dopamine connection. I think that's uh, that's money because I, I, I never have said that to my patients, even though I knew it. Showing the physical sugar, like I, I think in my clinic, I'm going to buy one of those things. I, because you've seen them where it shows you like a can of soda and then it shows you how much sugar physically right. in it, is in it. Like you said, the visual is so powerful. And you know, me personally, I actually do get organic fruits, veggies. I freeze them. I make a smoothie. I'm a busy resident, but I, I try to make time to just, you know, it's pretty easy to be able to make a smoothie. So, and that's what I always try to tell my patients. It's like, you know, if you start making time for it, it's the feedback your body gives you that makes you start going in that direction. Because you'll realize how much better you feel when you actually start eating better. That yes. most patients, once they experience experience that they don't want to go back to that baseline of low energy you know absolutely and and that's another buy-in for them mm. to do that you know so and what i say to people is say they you are teaching them to do smoothies a couple of tips about smoothies are mm -hmm. as americans we're lacking fiber in our diet we're not lacking protein we actually i know we're yep. worried about protein all the time but it's fiber that actually feeds our gut yeah. and that we need and we don't get enough of if we look at statistics one in ten americans eats enough vegetables Mm -hmm. so that's like nobody just yeah. you know exactly it's like literally nobody so so i say to people for smoothies if you're going to do that have like a quarter cup of berries that's that's fine you know mm -hmm. but don't load it with fruit add those veggies add those greens you know add add frozen veggies whatever it is to bulk it up add you know healthy fats and things like that because people also become sort of reliant on just a protein powder but then it then you have to look for a clean one. You know, I, I think with everyone, with all of us, we can tweak it a little bit. I like what you said about, you know, I understand you're busy, but just meal prepping and planning, even having mm -hmm. them just learn to plan out some foods would be helpful. Agreed. So what are some foods that can help uh, a depressed mood? I like to start with some, some pillars uh, such as learning and teaching people about prebiotic foods. Prebiotics are simply things like onions, leeks, garlic. There's several more, but those are just, you know, think about, hey, making a soup because you can use all of those or stir fry even. Then probiotics, you could take that as a supplement, but you can also get it through fermented foods or things like yogurt. And yogurts are now, I'm now seeing non-dairy yogurts in the supermarket aisle that have probiotics as well in them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just go for the plain ones. And fermented foods are things like kefir, kombucha, miso, tempeh, several others. So, so have those in your diet have sauerkraut or, or kimchi in your diet and build, build up on that. And then things like omega-3 fatty acids from fatty fish like salmon are actually shown to improve mood. But you, if you're plant-based, you know, you can get omega-3s, the shorter chain from chia seeds, flax seeds, walnuts, mm. and sea vegetables and things like that. Sometimes people don't eat seafood, so they want to know that. There are also certain versions of salmon that you can get canned. And, you know, if it's, if it's someone who feel it, it may, may be too costly, there are certain versions that, you know, you can still get some ben benefit from salmon. The other thing I should, should mention is that, you know, people forget things like spices that can be very powerful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, things like turmeric with a pinch of black pepper. And it turns out that saffron has a tremendous amount of evidence related to uh, depression. So mm -hmm. that those are worth adding. And sometimes you don't cook with enough saffron. So one of the things you might want to do is consider a supplement for that. I always like to go with food first, but, you know, if you need to, that's some, certainly something that you can do. And then, you know, things like oregano and lavender help depression, the vitamins that uh, in, in chapter 11 of my book, I sort of list the different vitamins and the different foods. Yeah. And I do that so that when you look at, say, the chapter one, a chapter on depression, and I say, you know, vitamins B12 or B1 or you know, whichever one it is, you can actually find foods that you can eat. And the other, the other big group is things like um, magnesium, uh, zinc, selenium help mood. 
And so making sure that, you know, you, you are taking enough through your food or if your doctor's checking your electrolytes, make sure that you're not deficient in those as well. And then healthy fats, you know, avocados, olive oil, things like that. Gotcha. And you mentioned in your book that you recommend the Mediterranean eating pattern or the MEP. So can you touch base on that a little bit? Sure. There have been a lot of large scale studies that have been done in the mm -hmm. and on the Mediterranean diet that have shown an improvement of uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety. So I think that if someone were to just say, well, what's a good way to get started? Why do I like that? Because it, it encourages the use of vegetables, a great baseline for your fiber. Right? It also has, does include fish, it includes meats, so people can do that, but it also has healthy fat like olive oil or avocado. It encourages legumes, chickpeas, lentils, as well as fruits. It covers a lot of good basic stuff that we need, and I mm -hmm. think it's just a way that people can feel they can get started. You know, some adaptations to that, a lot of people who are more plant-based. If you're more plant-based, then lean into the plants in that diet. If you say keto, you know, you can almost make a combination of a keto Mediterranean diet. So, so there are ways to adapt this to who the person is, but that's one of my favorites just because it has shown to be effective. Mm -hmm. And, you know, vegetables, I suggest the more complex carbohydrate rich vegetables and going toward, you know, the more starchy vegetables. What are some examples of ones that are less starchy? So Right. So I like things like cruciferous vegetables, cabbage, right. cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, all of those are uh, rich in sulfurophanes. They're good. They're low calorie. They can be used, you know, many different ways. And I love leafy greens because of the folate boost and they have a lot of good nutrients in them. So building a salad or, you know, having cooked spinach or whatever it is as part of your meal is important. And spices are what change it up. Right? Spices are what make it a different, more interesting, more exciting can make it more of an Indian version, more of a Mexican version. Yeah. It's all the spices. And the thing you mentioned in your book, using turmeric and black pepper, and it's funny because coming from an Indian background, I feel like every dish has, a, has a little bit of both. So it's Definitely. cool that the science catches up to that. And it. so you yeah. said that black pepper actually helps convert the turmeric into curcumin or what? what's going on there? So, so purpurine and black pepper activates the curcumin. Curcumin is the active ingredient in turmeric, not the same as cumin. I know you know know that. But mm -hmm. uh, for your audience, like, cumin is a whole different spice. So it activates the curcumin and makes it about 2000% cool. more bioavailable to the brain and body. So so it's, it's worth it. That pinch of black pepper is totally worth it. If, if you know, if, if you don't usually have it. Yeah. Isn't that cool how nature designed things that way? I mean, yeah. uh, that's pretty mind blowing. So next, I wanted to talk about anxiety. So anxiety disorders are the most common type of psychiatric disorders in the U.S., uh, with up to a third of the population suffering from them. And then only like 50 or 60 percent of people actually respond to medication or psychotherapy. So yeah. what is the anxious gut? You know, the anxious gut is the you, you've heard the expression, you know, feeling queasy, knots in my stomach, butterflies. And, and you know, it's it's sort of it's interesting to me that so many of those expressions bear to be true in terms of those feelings that people will actually talk about when they're feeling anxious. And it turns out that, you know, so many things can worsen anxiety. The foods we spoke about earlier, we have to be careful about caffeine because caffeine can actually make people more anxious. So if they notice that, again, paying attention to body intelligence, they want to stay either, they want to switch to decaf or half-caf or stay under 400 milligrams of caffeine a day and have it early in the day so that it doesn't disrupt their sleep and, and drive the anxiety. Other things to worry about is gluten was found to be associated with worsening symptoms of anxiety. Sometimes people have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Mm -hmm. I actually had someone recently who said they'd struggled with depression for a long time until they got tested and realized that they had not celiac disease, but sort of this non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And by cutting out gluten, their symptoms improved. So gluten was associated with as well as artificial sweeteners like aspartame, saccharin, sucralose. And like I mentioned, unfortunately, stevia did worsen symptoms of anxiety, then being cautious with alcohol, how you consume alcohol, when you consume it, and the fact that we all have to be a little bit careful because during the pandemic, we know from, from studies and from some CDC data that use of alcohol and drugs has increased. So we've got to be careful mm -hmm. about that. So, you know, just, just helping people understand that. But, you know, foods that can help, are we go back to the omega-3s because they actually also help anxiety. We go back to high fiber foods because they 
it break down more slowly in the body. So less of an insulin spike. So unlike maybe eating a sugary donut and you may crash a little bit later, or you may notice that you have a different feeling when you eat a more fiber rich diet that has complex carbohydrates, it breaks down slowly in your body. You feel satiated and fuller for longer, but then also your mood and your, your emotional state follows on a more even keel. Other foods that were helpful were, you know, fermented foods again, certain vitamins, a certain minerals, especially magnesium, very helpful in anxiety. Mm -hmm. Turmeric shows up again. And then a lot of things that you can actually have as tea, like a lavender or passion flower or chamomile tea were found to help with anxiety. But turmeric features there as well. So oh, important to know. Now we can't talk about anxiety without talking about caffeine. So yep. how much caffeine is okay to have in a day? So again, I, I what I ask people to do is really pay attention to something with alcohol. You know, if you have a half a glass of wine, a glass of wine, you suddenly feel jittery. Same thing with coffee. If you have coffee and you feel on edge, people say to you, you're suddenly becoming irritable or your heart is racing. You need to pay attention that maybe you are more sensitive to caffeine mm -hmm. than you realize. So cutting back. If you like coffee, stick to 400 milligrams or less in a day. And I break that down in the book and give examples of types of coffee because I looked into it so people could know, well, drink this. Oh, yeah. or, you know, And then, then have it by 12 or two in the day. So it doesn't affect your sleep. So enjoy coffee. I think as with alcohol, the issue with coffee is what we add to it. So, yeah. you know, it, it it's the sugar, or the, the ton of artificial sleep, whatever it is, that's, that's usually the problem. Coffee itself is not on its own, in my opinion, and from what I've looked at, bad for us. It's just the amount we drink, when we drink it, so it doesn't impact sleep and controlling it if it's driving anxiety, cut back and cut back right. slowly because, you know, you can develop caffeine withdrawal as well. Definitely. Now, how much coffee do you usually recommend? I'm a coffee lover myself. I would say for someone like yourself, you find out the type of coffee that you either buy or purchase and make at home and just find out the grams of coffee in it. So studies have guided us to 400 milligrams in a day or less. And, you know, some people can have coffee at dinner and be fine, but not everyone is that way. So yeah. that that becomes important. Some people can, you know, will order espresso dinner when we could go out it's for true, dinner yeah. and, yeah. and it'd be fine and others cannot. So you really have to pay attention to that in yourself. I would say just look up what you're buying. And, you know, for example, lots of apps have the information if you're getting it from a coffee store mm -hmm. or if you buying it. And that's that's been some good guidance. Okay. That's uh, that's really good advice. Thank you. Now, I did want to talk about PTSD. So of all the psychiatric syndromes that you discuss in your book, PTSD has one of the strongest brain-body relationships, at least in terms of data. What can you tell us about trauma in the gut? What we know is that there's almost, let me put it this way, there have been studies that have looked at how the gut has memory. And some of these have been animal studies that looked at basically using the gut of a germ-free mouse and placing and inserting the gut or doing a fecal uh, transplant from a mouse that was heavy. Mm. And the lean mouse without a microbiome or who's germ-free actually then puts on weight. So we know from, from some of the research that there is memory and we know that's genetic material in the microbiome. Yep. So I guess what I would say about PTSD is it is a very complicated condition, not something to be taken lightly, that many people have forms of PTSD, even PTSD around the pandemic and the actual, you know, living through the pandemic and that we need to A, pay attention to it, seek therapy. That's a very important part of working with PTSD, but there are foods that you can eat that I list as well. I think knowing that you might have symptoms of trauma becomes important. I cannot tell you the number of times I've evaluated someone and they don't realize they've had a traumatic event or identified it as such. And I see you shaking your head. So I know that that's happened to you too. Mm -hmm. So just bringing it again, bringing it to the forefront of their attention and figuring out or helping them understand it was a traumatic event. And I'm not talking about trying to get into people's memories. I'm talking about as they're providing a history, they don't realize something bad that has happened to them might have caused a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. And that's the first place, understanding and education and then working on, you you know, dietary means to improve those symptoms. But again, I go back to those pillars of how you can start to adjust your whole healthy eating. Mm -hmm. You know, that principle of eat the orange, skip the store-bought orange juice, which has added sugars, no fiber, and, you know, who knows what else. But, you know, just have the orange. It's it's that sort of thing. And you commented that there were some overlapping foods and there are. The early part of the book, I talk about how to use the book because someone might just need one chapter of the book to work on. But 
you know, that's where the principles or the pillars of nutritional psychiatry come in. There are a lot of overlapping foods, but then you tweak it. So example, nitrates in processed meats worsen depression. Mm. So, you know, that's important for people to know if that's if they're eating deli meats every day. It's important to know where they're getting it from. I'm saying it's just, it's not as straightforward as it sometimes seems. It's a little more complicated. Oh, absolutely. No, that, yeah. that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. Now, are there foods that can deepen trauma? If so, which ones do you usually recommend avoiding? Yeah, you know, I think that the way to think about it is that we go back to glutamates can be a problem here too. And studies show that. So, you know, maybe being a little bit careful about having too many of those foods, as well as, you know, the components of the standard American diet, the, you know, the fried foods, the refined flours, the refined sugars, you know, the trans fats, all of those can just not, they're not helping your gut microbiome. They're not helping your mental state because they really, what they're doing for one thing is they're setting up inflammation in your Mm -hmm. body. And inflammation is now consistently being shown not only in metabolic health, but also in mental health as being concerning. So neuroinflammation is a big driver of disease. Gotcha. What is metabolic syndrome and how can it impact PTSD? I think the way I'll explain how I see this in individuals with mental health symptoms is several Mm -hmm. psychotropic medications that unfortunately impair glucose tolerance and start to really work on insulin resistance and set up almost symptoms of inflammation in the body. So one way to think about it is if you are an individual listening to this and you are prescribing or taking psychiatric medications, some of the antipsychotics have these problems, then you need to be, you know, monitoring or having a doctor monitor your blood glucose levels, your electrolytes, checking on your cholesterol, your LDL. And there's been a lot of updated research on Mm -hmm. which form of cholesterol is good and what's good and what's not and things like that. So we've actually revisited our thinking about that even after I wrote the book. Those are things that if you're either prescribing or you are taking, you need to pay attention to with your doctor. And it's just a setup for sort of our poor metabolic health where we start to develop insulin resistance, impaired glucose tolerance, and that just sets up a cascade of different diseases. Mm-hmm. And I think obesity is like the the central tenet of that. And you, you mentioned a pretty incredible study done by a researcher who was a New York State trooper for about 23 years. The results of the study has showed that uh, officers with severe PTSD that were more obese had almost three times the rate of metabolic syndrome than those with uh, milder forms of PTSD. Exactly. Uh, the same, I believe, was found in military vets as well. Yeah, so yeah, very, absolutely. very fascinating. Unfortunately, what I sometimes see is the person has obesity already, and then you have the problems, or they start a medication, which mm-hmm. starts that cascade of poor metabolic health. Very big component of the country is sort of in the overweight range. So it's yeah. something we should be paying attention to. That that relationship with uh, food. We have Bessel van der Kolk on the podcast, and, and uh, you might know him. Have you worked with him since you guys are both I, like... I haven't worked with him, and I'm familiar with Oh, that's going to happen Michael. soon. Uh, yeah. Both of you guys are just pioneers in, uh, in your field. But, you know, he, he's the one that told me that the ACEs was actually based around people's relationship with food initially because they realized Mm. people with PTSD, uh, they had a different type of relationship with food, whether they would eat less or more. And it's fascinating because if you look at it from like a childhood trauma standpoint and having, you know, an adverse relationship with food from an early get go, how Mm. you could see metabolic syndrome and the correlation between PTSD in the future is pretty interesting to think about. One of the things I really wanted to touch on is ADHD, especially because for myself growing up, uh, I thought I had ADHD for a really long time, just very, very hyperactive, you know? So Mm -hmm. this part of the book was very, very useful for me. If uh, ADHD, if it causes chemical imbalances in your brain, what role does the gut play in this? So this is where, you know, it was interesting that eating a diet rich in polyphenols, which, you know, included things like berries and cherries and other foods became important. But also some studies show that individuals with ADHD really should eat breakfast. It's it's one of the things I, I try to encourage. One of the reasons is often the medications prescribed for ADHD will suppress right. appetite. And so it becomes important to help their focus to not skip breakfast. And it's just a little tip that I think has helped a lot of my, my patients. But then, you know, things that 
a little bit of caffeine can actually be helpful. I have individuals who like a little bit of green tea. It helps them focus because of the antioxidants in them. And then foods rich in B vitamins and vitamin C and certain minerals were found to be helpful. And I think the it's also important to understand that there's an issue with dairy here. Mm. You know, some people don't consume dairy at all, but those who do, if you are struggling with symptoms of focus, it, it was found that the A1 milk caseins were problematic. And now there are uh, milks on the market that are called A2 milks mm -hmm. or, you know, go for nut milk or have goats or sheep sheep milks, cheeses, if you have a problem, then, you know, you won't be surprised with sugar being on this list. Any parent with little children will, will tell you that can be an issue. And gluten was also found to have an association there. But with gluten, I will ask people to cut back for a little while and see if they notice a difference in, in how they're feeling. And that's actually often a good test just to see um, how mm -hmm. someone is doing. Okay, that makes sense. Now, there's been a, I'm not sure if you're aware, there, there's been a rising popularity in the, the carnivore diet. It's kind of a nose to tail eating. It's a philosophy using every part of the animal in food preparation. Some say that it's uh, one of the most ethical ways of using an animal, using every part of it. So is there any data that actually backs a carnivore diet being beneficial? What are the risks and benefits of it? You know, it's not something where I have that much expertise. I know that the mm -hmm. carnivore movement cites a lot of data um, yeah. so you know some of the claims that they make and to be honest now i haven't examined the research of the carnivore diet to comment effectively okay. what i will say is that when someone comes to my practice whether they have a carnivore diet or vegan diet i've got to find a way to work with them mm -hmm. so i'm i remain diet agnostic you know i just i sort of say mm -hmm. well look if we're going to do this what can we do to increase your vegetables or you know where will the vegan get their vitamin b12 do we need to supplement that or, or what whatever it is in between i know it's a very strong movement but then so is the plant-based movement. So is the keto movement. You know, yeah, it's, it's, right. it's like that's a lot true. of, and I think that's where, that's where, uh, consumers get confused. Yeah, no, that's that's very true. That was answered like a, a true expert, you know, uh, where, where you're saying I don't have the expertise in that and I haven't done the research myself. I just figured I'd ask you because yeah. I have had some patients that, that are talking about the carnivore diet and I'm like, oh, yeah. I guess I need to look more into that because that, that movement is growing stronger and stronger by the day. So, yeah. I mean, definitely what, what has changed since some of the guidelines and things like that is, you know, that red meat is, is, is acceptable. It's not, you know, we don't need to fear it the way that we were we taught at different stages of our lives. And for me, what, what I've understood by some of those types of data is that it's the source of the red meat. You know, yes. it's, it's it's much more important that you get a well-sourced, you know, grass-fed does become important. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's it's out of your price range. I totally understand that. But at least knowing what the potential effects becomes important. But there's no longer that fear of, you know, oh, we can't consume this because of the, the wrong types of fats and stuff. A lot of that has actually evolved in the research. Gotcha. Yeah. And I, I, I was happy to see that, especially grass-fed because um, yeah. it's so interesting. We grew up watching videos that cows are eating grass. But That's then right. when, you, when you go back and you, you look at, you know, a lot of the cows, they're being fed corn and like uh, these oh, things yeah. that plump them up make, make them taste That's right. better. But That's right. They grained off. Them. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I believe that changes the cow's microbiome and cows have like four stomachs, you know, so very, very fascinating when you look at like E. coli, how it grows a little bit more prevalently in cows that are corn fed versus cows that are uh, grass fed, but super cool stuff. I, I definitely want to do more research in that myself. So, Dr. Nadu, to end the segment, do you have any tips or recommendations for like easy food swaps or, you know, substitutions? Because usually we have like 15 to 30 minutes with a patient and um, mm -hmm. like, what are your go-tos that you usually recommend sure. that people can try? I talk to people about meal prep and planning their grocery list so that they are prepared for the week. I talk to them about if they like pretzels and chips, how they can make kale or spinach chips in the oven, 20 minutes, avocado oil, salt, pepper, any spices they like and eat it fresh and it's crunchy. The whole family can have a tray of that instead of a crunchy salted snack. For sweets, I like to go with yogurt with berries and some cinnamon. Easy. Don't have to prepare anything. Yep. I qualify the types of yogurts earlier. Again, grass milk yogurt is better mm. in terms of inflammation. And things like pre-making chia pudding. You know, a bag of chia seeds can be a little pricey, but it's going to last you a very long, long time. time. Yeah. And all it is is chia seeds, just the ratio. I have the recipe in my book and coconut milk. You know, you have a dessert if you prefer to have it that way, or you have a breakfast that's rich in protein and fiber. And then uh, one of my favorite sort of dessert tricks is my avocado mousse 
that I make with super dark extra cacao. The recipe is on my Instagram, bana- yeah. soft bananas and uh, avocado. And, and and you whip it up and you don't realize it's not chocolate mousse. So, so it's just, it's almost training your brain to accept that there's a different way to eat things and that they can taste good. You know, as a chef, I actually do care very deeply that the food tastes good. So I'm not going to give you a recipe that tastes bad because yeah. I wouldn't eat it, you know? <laughs> so that becomes important. Or even things like, you know, um, you like crunchy snacks, make some chickpeas in the oven. Yeah. You can roast up some chickpeas, you know, learning things like there are now air fryer ovens and uh, oh, yeah, those are know, great. ovens that, yeah, that you don't have to deep fry stuff. Why not make, you know, zucchini fries for the kids in an air fry oven so it's you know it's it's taking things that we can that. do <laughs> take things and, and add some you know nice spices some parmesan cheese add something that you like and there are some great recipes even online to to do that but it's taking something a person like say a mom comes to me and says well her child will only eat french fries from the fast food store well can you do this you know can you substitute that and use an air fry oven okay and does Dr. Omanaidu take any supplements? You know, I actually take vitamin D because I live in the Northeast. Yeah. And, nah. and I, I don't recently certain I'm short of vitamin D. So it's just, uh, I take that. And so I feel that people should use supplements if if they feel that there are gaps in their diet. What I guide people around is you can't, you just like you can't exercise out of a bad diet, you can't supplement a bad diet. So exactly. you can take tons of supplements. And if you're not eating and exercising, it's not going to help. Yeah. It's going to do something. Thing. It's going to be absorbed probably, but you know, so rather start the other way, adjust your diet and then supplement the things you don't have. Like I think in the Northeast, it's, you know, it's a big level of sun is, right. <laughs> is different. So yeah, oh, absolutely. Just, absolutely. Okay, cool. And then, so where can our audience find you? Um, where can they find your book? And what are some cool things you're currently involved with that, you know, our audience can get involved with? Thank you. Uh, so you can follow me on social media. It's the best way to get involved with what I'm up to, because you'll see all my different activities. Yeah. Uh, and that's at D-R-U-M-A-N-A-I-D-O-O. You yep. can uh, subscribe to my website, umanaidumd.com, where you can get the book, but you can also get it at your local bookseller or Amazon. And cool things that I'm up to is I'm, I'm really planning some bigger things for, I, I don't have the details of them yet, but uh, my dream is to set up some sort of educational forum yeah. that will help educate more people in this area because I'm hearing on social media and from people through the hospital, through any any which way that people can reach me, that they want to learn more and more people want to oh, be yeah. able to do this kind of work. And I feel like that would be very important to bringing my message forward. Oh, and yeah. if I can help to do that, I would be honored and humbled to do it. Sometimes finding the mechanism to do that is important so that, you know, now individuals like yourself and others can do even a port- a component of the tr- of training that makes that language, what we talked about today, makes mm-hmm. that just a part of a regular internal medicine session yeah. or, you know, whoever it is evaluating the individual and not just doctors, you know, all, all uh, practitioners, clinicians. Uh, I'm so grateful that, you know, you're doing this because I have that dream. I want to see like nutrition like the way you're teaching it on the boards. Like I, I want it to yeah. be something that physicians are, are forced to be as rigorous in their training as everything else, you know? So again, I, I'm just grateful that you're out there and you're doing what you're doing. And for young physicians like myself, seeing that it's possible, seeing that you you made this possible for yourself and, you know, just that intention of, of wanting to give back and to give additional knowledge I'm um, seeing the fruition of that for me is is very gratifying. So thank you so much. I really appreciate thank you. Thank you. Thank you for appreciating that. And really appreciate what you all are doing and your your podcast. So thanks for inviting me. There you have it, folks. I hope you guys left this one feeling inspired. If you learned something new or if you genuinely enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and rate it five stars. Medspiration is a 501c3 nonprofit charity organization. The more you help us grow, the more people we're able to help. Let's make a commitment together, guys, and attempt to be the best possible version of ourselves, no matter what life throws at us, mentally, physically, and spiritually. As always, you know what time it is. It's time to get out there and to do something med-spiring.